go to Revelation. Revelation chapter number 11, all right, is where we're going to be tonight. Each week, if you are watching online or if you're here, you can get the notes off of the YouTube in the description under the video. It will have the notes. You can click on them, print them off. And you need the notes for last week and this week, especially, or, 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 or part 12 and part 13, especially because you're going to, uh, it's, it's a lot to take in. Um, we, we left off last time, uh, and remember, um, there, there, are, there are three sevens that happened in the book of Revelation. You guys remember that? Okay. We start the seven-year tribulation period, or Daniel's 70th week, with the seven what? Seven seals. You guys remember that? Seven sealed book. It's handed to Jesus in heaven. He begins to open those seals. As those seals begin to open up uh, in chapters uh, six and seven, as we go through there, things begin to happen on earth and it begins to play out. Um, after those, when we get to the, uh, the seventh seal, the seventh seal opens up seven what? seven trumpets, okay? These angels, uh, there's seven angels who have seven trumpets and they sound these trumpets and things continue to happen on the earth. Now, all the way up through the sixth trumpet, we are, if we are tracking, and you're going to see this in just a little while, chronologically, we are still in the first half of the, of the seven-year period. We haven't reached yet the midpoint. And the reason that we know that is because of the chapter that we're going to look at tonight, chapter 11, uh, is is one of the key passages. Because when you get to chapter 11, you you get into what I'm going to call mid-tribulation language, okay? Mid-tribulation language. And it's important to note, and and we have these clues. Um, And then once we get past the seventh trumpet, and it opens up seven bowls or seven vials full of the wrath of God. And the Bible says that these are the last plagues. So we know that the bowls or the vials are last. We know that the seals start it. And so when we're during the trumpets, we're in the middle, right in that area. Okay. Uh, And and what we're going to look at tonight is a uh, 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 the uh, chapter 11, which is what they call a parenthetical chapter. Okay. And a parenthetical chapter is you're walking through the events playing out in this tribulation, this first three and a half years of tribulation. You're seeing it play out. And then what the Lord will do through John's writing is he'll set the context here and say, okay, this earthquake's happening and this happening and this happening, this natural disaster and this is happening. And then he will zoom out and show you a different angle, okay, or show you what is going on at that same time from another vantage point. Does that make sense? During the three and a half years, you are seeing uh, a lot of calamity, a lot of death, a lot of war, a lot of sickness, a lot of disease, but also, see, that's one vantage point. But if you look at it from over here, the first three and a half years, you're also seeing the greatest revival that the world will have ever seen. You're seeing an innumerable number of people coming to know the Lord. You're also seeing, during that same three and a half years, martyrdom of those people. And their souls are going on to heaven, and they're praying to the Lord, Lord, how long (coughs) until you avenge our death? And he's like, hold on, there's going to be more like you, so sit tight, okay? So you're seeing a lot of different viewpoints from that first three and a half years, okay? Now, we're reaching, and I, I compared it to this two weeks ago, you're on a roller coaster. How many like roller coasters? Y'all are crazy, all right? You probably like snakes too, don't you? How many like snakes? Ah, you people, snakes? I don't like snakes. I didn't, you know why? I have a biblical reason, okay? Garden Eden, boom, that, that's it, ended, ended. Haven't cared for snakes since then? Uh, uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Where was I? Okay, chapter 10 that we looked at last week, uh, or the last time that we were together, it ended uh, with the mighty angel, okay? So the sixth trumpet sounds, okay? The sixth trumpet sounds, and these calamities happen. Then a mighty angel, John sees in chapter 10, he steps up and he puts one foot 
on the earth and one foot on the sea. And the Bible says that he roars like a lion. Now, if you look at the, at the language of that angel, we don't know, uh, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, is that talking about, is, is G, you know, is Jesus that, that messenger, that angel, that, that Greek word there? And I, and I don't think so, but a, but a lot of the language, like his appearance is bright, his feet are like they're on fire, and he's this booming lion voice. I mean, it's, it is an authoritative picture for sure. And this roaring of this lion comes. And what the lion, the angel that roars like a lion, declares is after that sixth trumpet, Okay? We've had the seven seals. We've had six trumpet. Here's what he says. He says, time will be no more. That's what the King James language says. There's not going to be any more time. What that means is there's not going to be any further delay until God brings a reckoning on the earth and sets up his kingdom. It is here. It's game time is what he's saying. Okay, And he roars like a lion when he says that. And it's a proclamation in heaven. And, and, and the heavenlies are de- declaring it. And this angel roars it out. Then that angel has in his book or in his hand a book that's open, a little book. And it contains... Uh, 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 you know, it's been opened up, and, and we know that that's a scroll, and we've studied about that at the beginning of our Revelation series. Well, this angel makes a, uh, a swears, the Bible says, by him who sits on the throne uh, and, and, and swears uh, by the Father in heaven that there will be time no longer and that we're ushering in the kingdom of God. And he also says something that's very key in chapter number 10. He says... Uh, and I'll just read it to you. I'm not going to show it to you on the screen. I didn't put it in for him. But here's what he says. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, remember that seventh trumpet, when, he, when that seventh angel with the seventh trumpet sounds, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So here's what you got to understand. When you get to the seventh trumpet, Okay, you've been through the seals. It's really bad. There's world war. There's death. There's famine. A quarter of the world's population is killed here. A third over here. I mean, a massive. I'm, I'm talking hundreds, hundreds of millions of people dying, maybe even billions. Okay, during this first three and a half years, it's it's unbelievable devastation. Then, when you get to the seventh trumpet, the angel declares that when that trumpet begins to sound, when that seventh angel begins to sound. What's going to happen is the end is going to be wrapped up. It's going to be finished while that seventh trumpet is sounding. And what we see from here on in the book of Revelation is when that seventh trumpet, where's my marker? When that seventh trumpet sounds, it opens up seven, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? And these are the bowls or the vials of the wrath of God. So these bowls are opened up at the seventh trumpet. So the seventh trumpet sounds, and the Bible says that as the seventh trumpet sounds, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So this is not a one-time sound and it stops, but the seventh trumpet sounds, and when it sounds, we know that the end is going to be ushered in. So the seventh trumpet unlocks the seven bowls. Does that make sense? And so as that seventh trumpet is sounding, it is something that lasts. It says, but in the days of the angel that sounds the seventh trumpet. So it lasts for days. Okay, this is a period of time that this seventh trumpet is is sounding. Okay, now, um, uh, yeah. So I, I just wanted to set the stage there. And then, uh, of course, the angel tells John, and where we left off was, he said, eat the book, okay? He said, I want you to eat this book. He said, it'll be sweet in your mouth, but it'll make your belly bitter. In other words, when John saw the end of mankind and God's judgment, what it did was it was sweet in one sense because God is righting all the wrongs, but it is sad and bitter. It's bitter sweet because it is a horrible horrible thing that's going to be poured out on the earth and going to be played out uh, in these scenes. So chapter number 11, chapter number 11, if you uh, are a writer in your Bible and you write notes in your Bible, you can write down uh, in chapter number 11, this is a mid-tribulation chapter, okay? And I'm going to show you why right now. Remember, 
this is just a different viewpoint. Chapter 11 is a different viewpoint of the same events that are going on during the first three and a half years, okay? The Bible says, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod. What I want you to know about that is that basically John is given a measuring tape, okay? That's what he's given. And the Bible says, the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So notice, he's told to rise, measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. What stands out to you there? He's measuring the what? The temple. What temple? That's what you ought to be asking. If you go to Jerusalem tonight, there ain't no temple. There have been how many thus far in history as of tonight? Two, right? The first one was destroyed by Babylon. The second one was destroyed by the Romans. We went through all that history in AD 70. There hadn't been a temple since AD 70. From AD 70 to AD 2021, and who knows for how much longer, there has been no temple. But at this time in history, John is told to what? Measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. This is what it tells you. There's a temple. There's an altar where sacrifices are done in the temple. And they, there are people worshiping therein. Now look at the next verse. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out. So John is told, measure the temple, the altar, and all the people worshiping. But when you get outside in the courtyard area, the court, he said, leave that out. And he tells us why. And measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread under 40 and 2 months. Everybody say 42 months. You need to know that. If you're going to know Revelation, you need to know 42 months. Okay? 42 months is exactly three and a half years on a Jewish calendar, 30-day calendar, 30-day month. Three and a half years is 42 months. It's also 1,260 days. If you divide 1260 by 30, you come to 42 months, and that's three and a half years on the Jewish calendar. <clears throat> the Bible also calls it this in Revelation. I'll just give you this for your notes. It calls it time, times, and half time. Time, one year. Times, two more years, plural. One plus two is three. And a half, okay? That's how it says it. That's that's a, a chronology, revelation style, okay? So John is told to measure the temple and the altar and them that worship therein, but leave the courtyard out because who's who's controlling it? Okay, so what does that tell us? It tells us there's a temple, there's sacrifice on the temple, and there is a shared possession of the temple area. Tonight, there is a temple mount. How many know that? The temple mount. There is, okay, right now, the Muslims control the temple mount. The Jews pray at the Western Wall and all that kind of stuff, and different parts of the city are controlled by different sects, and, 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 and man, that temple mount is holy ground, right? At some point in the future, okay, and I am not convinced, by the way, I'm not convinced, 100% sure, uh, that that was the Temple Mount. Okay, I'm not 100% sure about that. That's what history says. Okay, but there is some really good evidence. Uh, a guy named Bob Cornuke wrote a book and uh, did a lot of investigation that the temple might have been located, uh, uh, Solomon's Temple, down the mountain in the old city, the, the, uh, the city of David. Uh, and it makes a very strong and compelling case for that. Uh, there, was, there was, There's no water up that high on the mountain. There's the Gion Spring, okay, down below uh, in the city of David, and they have done excavation, and they, is, they have found uh, uh, what he thinks is, is where they kept the animals that were going to be sacrificed. So there's, there's, that is not what I'm saying is that's the consensus view, but it's not the only view, okay? And I'm not going to sit here because I, I don't know where it was, okay? Uh, you, you say, well, what was the, you know, the big area then? Uh, some it is it is about twelve acres, okay. That Temple Mount, and it's the exact size of of how 
the Roman, uh, as they stationed their troops, they would build forts that big, and that that might have been where the, the, uh, the Fortress Antonia, there was about 6,000 soldiers stationed there, and Fortress Antonia wasn't big enough to hold them all. I mean, so there's a big argument to be made in all that, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but wherever the temple is built, whether it's on the what we call the Temple Mount, or down the mountain, or wherever, there is going to be an agreement that the Jews share it with the Gentiles, or we might say the Muslims. There's going to be a shared agreement. And what do we hear in our, we've heard it all of our life. We need peace in the Middle East between Israel and uh, the Arab countries, and it should be a two-state two, uh, two solution. And a lot of people say, you know, it should be a two-state. I say it should be a one-state solution and, and just take the Bible's word out and give it all to Israel. Okay, but that's not how it's going to play out. Uh, I don't think Israel just gets that little sliver. I think they get all the way to the Nile River and all the way to the Euphrates River, and they get a big old chunk of Iraq and all that kind of stuff, but what do I know, okay? Um, so what, what I want you to understand here is there's a shared agreement, and John is told to measure the temple. So we, we know there's a temple coming sometime in the future. Okay, The Jewish people, by the way, are ready to build that temple right now. The only thing they don't have or that we don't know if they have is the Ark of the Covenant. They've got all the altars. They've got all the priestly garments. They've got the lineage of the priest. They are ready to go into operation with a temple right now. They're ready, and it's coming. There is a third temple. It's talked about right here. Here's the deal. You say, Brandon, how do you know that we're still in the first half of tribulation and we're not uh, uh, in the second half yet? Okay, I want to show you this. Daniel 9.27. I want to show you a verse. Daniel 9.27. I'm not going to hurry through this because you need to understand this chapter. This is an important chapter in Revelation. You remember the 70-week prophecy of Daniel? We've been through it. If you've been around here, 70-week prophecy of Daniel. If you study that prophecy, it foretells. There's four verses. Okay, chapter uh, 9, verse 24, 25, 26, and 27. Okay, that lay out. It is the most unbelievable end-time prophecy uh, that there is. Okay, it lays out when the Messiah is going to come, when he's going to die, down to the day. There's going to be a pause and a break, and then... One day, there's going to be a prince who comes out of uh, the uh, the people who destroyed the temple in AD 70, and we know that's the Romans. So there's going to be somebody come out of the revived Roman Empire who's going to be a world leader, and he is going to usher in the kingdom of God. That's what Daniel tells us. Here's what it tells us about this leader. How many have heard of the Antichrist? Okay, I know I'm babbling up here, and if you have, if you're just one of the worst things is like, <laughs> some of you make me cringe. You're like, hey, I got this friend, and uh, they, you know, they they haven't gone to church, but but I've got them watching Revelation, and I'm like, oh my goodness, great, right? It's like jump straight into the deep end, all right? It's like great. Right? I don't even know if they're saved, but they're in the Revelation series, all right? And I welcome you, and I love it that we do that. But you are in deep stuff, okay? This is not flannel graph world in Sunday school, all right? This is is big boy stuff and big girl stuff, all right? Now. Daniel 9.27 tells us about this coming world leader, the Antichrist, and here's what he's going to do. Here's how he is going to begin his reign. He's going to make or confirm, the Bible says. He may not make it. He may just sign on to it. But he's going to confirm the covenant or the peace agreement with many for one week. If you've studied our series, you know one week is for how many years? Seven years. There's going to be a seven-year peace agreement that the Antichrist is going to sign on to or come up with. It says he's going to confirm it. If I confirm something, it's something that's already in motion, all right? But he's going to sign on to this confirm it, okay? There's going to be a peace agreement, and this is a chapter that deals with Israel and Jerusalem. So there's going to be a peace agreement with the Jewish people for, for seven years, okay? Then the Bible says, and in the midst of the week, how long's a week? Not seven days, but seven years in this context. In the middle of the seven years, what is the middle of seven? Okay, three and a half years. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week. So the middle of the week at the three and a half mid-trib, mid-tribulation moment, what's going to happen? He, Antichrist, think of that, shall cause the sacrifice. What sacrifice? The sacrifice going on on in the temple. 
The temple that he just made an agreement with the Jewish people, there's a third temple. We're reading about it in Revelation. In the middle of the seven years, he's going to say, hey, you can't do that anymore. He's going to stop and break his word and break the agreement. You ever seen a politician that lies? It's going to continue, apparently, for a while longer. You ever seen a politician that's controlled by the devil? Yeah, that continues too, okay? We got some of those, all right? My goodness, we're in a mess. You know that? Man, I get depressed when I watch the news. I got to kind of just read the Bible and not do it. No, don't turn that junk on, man. Turn it on and find out we're going to war and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and inflation. My goodness, all right. Lord, come on. Let's go. All right, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go, let's go. Even so come Lord Jesus, right? All right? Watch this. He's going to cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So the, 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 the goings on at the temple. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it, the temple area, desolate. What he's going to do is he's not only going to stop them from worshiping there, he's going to go in to that place and defile it. He's going to defile it. The Bible says, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. He shall make it desolate with the overspreading of abominations. Okay, this has happened once before. It's happened once before uh, in the in the the uh, Jewish people celebrate the cleansing of the temple called Hanukkah. What are they cleansing the temple from? They're cleansing the temple from a guy who was a uh, a king. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes, and before Christ, before the time of Christ, he went took over Jerusalem, took over the temple, and he defiled the temple and desecrated the temple. Okay, it's talked about in Daniel. Uh, it's happened once before. They 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 uh, purified the temple. And went through the Hanukkah celebration. That's what Hanukkah is separating, uh, celebrating is the, the, the purification of the temple after Antiochus defiled it. Well, Antiochus was a type. A lot of times you see those types in the Bible that somebody did something a long time ago, but they're a type of some, somebody, the Antichrist, that's going to do that same thing again. Well, in the end time, it's going to be defiled again. There's going to build a third temple. There's going to be an agreement. Hey, Jews, you can sacrifice here. This part over here belongs to the Gentiles. This part belongs to the Jews. You can sacrifice, do all that kind of stuff. Well, they're going to do that. In the middle, three and a half years in, he's going to break his word. And he's going to say he can't do that. And the Bible says in, in, in Thessalonians that the Antichrist is actually going to go into the temple of God that has the name of God on it, and he's going to set himself up as God to be worshipped. So we get a glimpse of what this is going to look like. So Daniel tells us about this, okay, in Daniel 9. 600 years before Christ, one of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible, if, I mean, just unbelievable. He's not the only one that tells us about this, though. Jesus tells us about the mid-tribulation moment. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, they ask Jesus about the end times, and they're like, what do we do? And that's when he says, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, right? And he said, nation's going to rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, right? And he walks them through all this kind of stuff. There's going to be uh, the spreading of the gospel, okay? And he goes through all this kind of stuff. Brother's going to turn against brother, sister against, you know, all this kind of stuff. He lays out the first 14 verses, what's going to happen. Then when he gets to 15, he's like, hey, when he gets to 15, he changes his tone and he says this, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Notice the language abomination of desolation. Sounds very similar to what Daniel said. There's going to be overspread abominations that are going to make desolate the, the uh, temple area. So Jesus says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? Daniel. What's he pointing us back to? He's like, Daniel talked about this, and I'm, uh, I'm here to vouch for it. When you see that spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, Whosoever we readeth, let him understand. If you keep reading, you know what Jesus says? When you see the abomination of desolation, when you see the Antichrist move into the temple ground, stop the sacrifice, and overspread it with abominations, you know what he says in the next few verses? Run for your life. Don't go into your house and get a change of clothes. Don't do this. And he said, you better pray that you're not pregnant or giving uh, uh, nursing babies during that time. That's what he says. This is ushering in a time. And remember, chapter 10, right before, the angel who stepped out on the sea and on the land and said, hey, he roared like a lion. He said, time will be no longer. No more delay. It's here. 
So he's, he's, he's saying this, okay? So Revelation 11, 1 and 2 tells us that there's going to be a shared temple area, and we, we find that. Now, something else is going to be going on during the first three and a half years, or 42 months, or 1260 days, or time, times, and half a time. They're called the two witnesses. How many have ever heard of the two witnesses? This is cool. Listen up. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days. A thousand, two hundred, and threescore. What's a score? Twenty? What's threescore? Sixty. Y'all are smart, okay? One thousand, two hundred, sixty days, or how many months? Or how many years? Oh, right? Or time, times, and half a time. Okay, you're becoming... In verse 2, it said the Gentiles are going to have the court area for 42 months. That's three and a half years. Then he says these two witnesses are going to prophesy or preach, or actually prophesy means foretell events before they happen. They're going to tell and prophesy these events for 1, uh, uh, 1,260 days. Uh, 1,203 square days clothed in sackcloth. Now notice that, clothed in sackcloth. Why did you why did you wear sackcloth? You know what sackcloth was? Mourning. Okay? Repentance. Putting yourself in a humble frame frame of mind. What sackcloth was, it was almost like looked like a burlap. You ever seen burlap? Real rough. What they would do is they would wear if they put their they would put sackcloth on when they were in mourning. And what it what it, they wouldn't wear comfortable clothes that were comfortable to the skin. They would irritate their skin by wearing that. And it was a way of showing mourning or repentance. Okay? Uh, Job, sackcloth, ashes poured on his head. It was, a, it was a humbled state. Well, the Bible says that there's two witnesses for 1,260 days, okay? Or this time, three and a half years, the first three and a half years, we're going to find out in just a second, okay? that these witnesses are prophesying, two witnesses prophesying in sackcloth. What do you think they're going to be preaching? You know what I think they're going to be saying? There's going to be a revival. Can you imagine? There's going to be a revival of uh, people coming to know Christ, but there's also going to be a revival of the Jewish people to the ways of their fathers in, in the in Torah. A lot of Jewish people today don't really believe in much. They don't really. I mean, yeah, 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 I don't know if it's really real or not. They've kind of lost hope a little bit. You, you remember when Moses showed up in Egypt and he's like, hey, God sent me. Who's God? <laughs> right? We've been down here 400 years, slaves. What's his name again? He's like, I am is his name. And they didn't believe in, they didn't buy in at first. He had to show them signs and what, you know, all that kind of stuff. All right. By the way, how many, uh, this just come to me. How many people did God send to the Jewish people to lead them out of Egypt? Two, who were they? They were Moses, but he had, remember Moses had an excuse. Why well, ain't a good talker? So God sent his brother Aaron. Now, let's, let's read on. These, these two witnesses, verse 4 tells us who they are. And I, you've probably never heard of this. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. I didn't know there were two olive trees, Lord. Well, it turns out he told us that there's two olive trees standing before him. And he told us that in the book of Zechariah, one of the Old Testament prophets. Let me show you this. Chapter 4, verse 2. Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 2. And he said, said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, uh, Zechariah is seeing a heavenly image. He said, and I said, I have a, and I have looked, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are the top, uh, are upon the top thereof, verse 3, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side. Thereof. So apparently in heaven with God is two olive trees that God referred to in Zechariah, and we don't know anything about them. 
We don't even know. We, I mean, it's olive trees. We didn't even know they're human beings, men. But apparently, they are the two who God is going to send to be a prophesier or a preacher during the three and a half years, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, there's going to be two preachers sent by God preaching and prophesying and foretelling events to come. And here's what I believe they're going to be saying. I think they're going to be saying, hey, look, hey, Jewish people, You've, you've, you, you've celebrated, uh, Hanukkah. You've celebrated Passover. You've done all this stuff all your life. Hey, look, Daniel in your Bible, in your scripture said that there's going to be an agreement for seven years and there's going to be another temple. He prophesied it right here and they're going to be telling them that. And you're in the middle of it, and they're going to be telling them, hey, it's not going to last forever. This guy that you made an agreement with, he's going to turn on you because the God of heaven is real, and he's going to be pointing them, and they're going to be preaching Jesus through the Old Testament, just like Jesus did with his disciples after his resurrection. They're going to walk them through the Old Testament. They're going to be preaching and foretelling events. And you know what's going to happen? Let's read on. Verse number, uh, well, let me just say this. Everybody's going to hate these guys. They're going to hate them. You know why they're going to hate him? Look at verse 4. Verse 5. If any man will hurt them, you can't hurt them. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. That is so cool. Tell me that ain't, Right? You've heard of like red hot preaching before? <laughs> Hellfire and damnation? You ain't seen nothing like you're going to see during that time. I mean, these guys, if you try to take them out, they can breathe fire and kill you. You say, Brandon, you really believe that? Yep. That's not all. These, verse 6, have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophets. Now, add that to all the plagues that have been happening in the seals and the trumpets. And oh, by the way, it hadn't rained. Now watch this. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. I've heard of that before, haven't you? Water turned to blood. I've heard of that. Okay? Now remember when a third of the ocean got turned to blood a couple chapters ago? I wonder if these guys had anything to do with it. Remember, we couldn't figure out, like, I mean, if you had a natural disaster and you had an asteroid strike the earth, it doesn't turn the water to blood, does it? I wonder if these two guys, fire-breathing preachers, have anything to do with it. I don't know. Just a thought. They have the power to turn it to blood, okay? Now, watch this. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So... Not only are all these really, really, really bad things happening, but these two guys are thorns in the side of everybody on earth because they're preaching at them all the time and they're telling and they're foretelling and they're, I mean, they're, man, they're preaching and they're breathing fire and I mean, they're doing all this kind of stuff. These witnesses. Here's the deal. Here's what everybody wants to know. Who are they? Who are these witnesses? I've heard all my life. Who people think they are. I've got opinions. I'm going to share them with you right here, right now. But we can be wrong. Do you know that? We don't have to know who they are. They don't have to be somebody who's already talked about in Scripture, I don't think. Right? They're two witnesses that God sends to preach during the tribulation, the first half of the tribulation. Somebody that is with God is going to be sent to earth to preach during the tribulation. There's going to be two of them. That's all we know, know. All right? Wouldn't it be cool to be one of them? Uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Uh, but I want to show you why people speculate who they are. And the reason they speculate who they are is, first of all, they're mentioned in Zechariah, two olive trees. Okay? It's already referenced that there's these two olive trees there in Zechariah's day. So that's why people say, okay, so 
So they're already with God. Then they're sent down, and let's look back. Verse number five says that they can bring fire out of their mouth and consume. Then it says, verse six, that they can shut heaven that it rain not. Well, it turns out that there's a, there's a, there's a preacher in the Bible talked about who could do and did those two things. His name was Elijah. Okay? Elijah. You ever heard of Elijah? Elijah was the one, by the way, that never died. He never died, and he was taken up in a whirlwind, the Bible says. The chariot sent from God came down, scooped him up. Elisha's walking along with him, and he just took him. Okay? We would call that in the New Testament, raptured. Okay? He was taken. He never died. Elijah, if you look at 2 Kings verse chapter 1, verse 10. Let me show you this real quick. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse number 10. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50. I love this story, by the way. Ahab gets really mad at Elijah, and so he sends like 50 guys down to, to get Elijah, and Elijah's sitting on a hill. And so they come up through there, and Elijah breathes fire out and kills him. So the king sends 50 more. He breathes fire out and kills him. By the third time, they're catching on. They're crawling over charred bodies of their buddies, right? And, and, and finally, when the, the guy comes, he's like, he comes like this. Please don't breathe fire out on me. Just please come talk to the king. And Elijah's like, all right, I'll go with you. You know, so like, okay, that's Elijah, all right? You know what else Elijah could do and did in the days of Eli uh, Ahab and Jezebel? What did he do? He caused it not to rain. That's why they hated him so much, okay? Elijah. So it is very possible, I believe, and if you said, Brandon, who are the two witnesses? And you told me to pick and make a choice, Elijah is in that bunch, okay? I believe that. Now, there is um, a, another one, okay? If you look at Revelation 11, the Bible says that they have power to turn water to blood and smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. There's a guy that actually had that power. His name was Moses. Moses, I'm sharing Elijah and Moses with you because I believe that these are the two most likely candidates for being the two witnesses, okay? Because, simply because, well, not so, well, there's two reasons, really, the, 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 the things that they can do. During this three and a half years, they can breathe out fire, okay? They can turn water, uh, or cause it not to rain. They can turn water into blood, and they can do plagues. Moses, when he was sent down, if you read Exodus, uh, look at Exodus seven nineteen. Uh, it says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they be, may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. When God turned the water into blood in Egypt, it wasn't just the rivers and the lakes. It was your bathtub. It was the, the, the water bottles that you had in your cupboard, you had the jugs of water that you had, it, it, everything. If you had a vessel of stone or you had drawn water out of a well, it, everything turned to blood. Didn't think about that, okay? Now, the, the very... The very powers that are given to these two witnesses seem to point to these two guys. Now, there is some different thoughts on that. A lot of people say Elijah, but Moses is kind of the debated one. Is it Moses? Okay, Elijah and Moses, I think it is. I'm going to tell you the second reason here in a second. But there are people who think Elijah and Enoch. Anybody ever heard of Enoch? Enoch was 365 years old. He had a son at age 65, okay? And when he was 365, the Bible says he was walking with God. He walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So he was alive, walking with God. He was really close to God, and God took him. We call that a rapture in the New Testament language. God took him without him dying. It is all throughout Scripture, okay? Enoch uh, had it, Elijah had it, all that kind of stuff, okay? Okay? Now, some people even make an argument that it is John who's one of these witnesses that's actually writing Revelation. 
uh, and one of the reasons might be uh, like, uh, for example, chapter 10 ends with the angel telling John, and he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So that's told to John. So some people make a, 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 an argument there. First of all, it doesn't have to be any of these guys. We're speculating, but we're letting the Bible kind of lead us. And so who in the Bible could bring down fire from heaven and turn water into blood? So we kind of deduce and, 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 and add up. Let me, let me show you a huge reason that I believe that it is Moses and Elijah, okay? Let me show you this. Um, go to uh, Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> Let me just flip over there real quick. Matthew 17, verse 1, And after six days Jesus, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. So Jesus takes two, three disciples, Peter, James, and John, uh, with him. Watch this, verse 2, And was transfigured before them. You ever heard of the transfiguration? This is the transfiguration, okay? Not, not, not preached on a whole lot, transfiguration. They go up on a high mountain, okay? And Jesus takes Peter and James and John with him. And the Bible says he and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun and his raiment or his clothing was white as the light. Okay? Jesus went up on a high mountain and the word transfigured there in the Greek is he was metam metamorphosized in front of him. He they saw, okay, and I, I've told you my thoughts on uh, the, the world. <clears throat> you can call it, give it a label of dimensions or whatever you want, but I believe that there is a, a spiritual world that we cannot see, but it's right here. It's right there, okay? And I, I, I don't ask me to explain that. I'm not a physicist. I'm not, but I believe uh, that, that they are there. I believe we see glimpses of it in Scripture, Okay, Elijah okay, had, a, had a servant. His name was Gehazi. They were in a city one time. The enemy surrounded the city, and they were going to uh, do away with that city and, 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 and uh, uh, destroy everything and everyone. Okay? And Elijah prayed to the Lord. He said, Lord, let his eyes be open. And he prayed for Gehazi, his servant, and let his eyes be open. He said, show him, Lord. Never prayed that he could see it. But he prayed for his servant to be able to see. And the Bible says Gehazi looked, and he didn't see just the armies that were a camp of the enemy around him. He saw the angel armies that were around them. He, you couldn't see it with just your naked eye. And I always, man, that's why I like Elijah too, because it, it takes some faith to say, Lord, let him see. I'm good. That's big faith. I don't care. Because we're like, God, show me a sign. Show me that everything's going to be okay. It takes faith to say, God, show my wife, show my husband. I'm good. I know you got it. Some big faith. So Jesus was transfigured or metamorphosized before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Look at verse 3. And behold, there appeared unto them, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, who? Moses and Elijah talking with him. So in Jesus' ministry of three years on this earth, he goes up to a mountain one day, and his disciples get to see him as he looks in heaven. The veil is pulled back, and they see Jesus like bright shining, and guess who's standing there talking to him? Moses and Elijah. Kind of interesting. It's also interesting, too, and I'll just point out this, and I'm going to move on. Elijah never died. We understand that, right? He was taken by God. Moses died. And there's a very interesting, and I'm going to be real honest with you, I have never, ever got to a comfort level with this passage where I understand what's going on. When Moses died, go look this up, read about it. When Moses died, Satan wanted Moses' body. 
And there was a fight over Moses' body. Why, Brandon? I don't know. I've never heard anybody with a good... I've heard a couple of expl- explanations, and I'm like, yeah, that don't sound right. Why in the world would Satan want Moses' body? Does he know something we don't know? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Head scratcher, for sure. Okay? So let's look back. Revelation 11. So here's these two witnesses, whoever they are. I've shared with you my opinion, and I try to always tell you it's my opinion. Watch this. Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony. In other words, when their ministry is done and they preach their last sermon, here's what happens to the two witnesses. Watch this. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. The end result for these preachers preaching for the first three and a half years of of, of the tribulation is that they are killed, notice this, by the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. Now, there was a beast mentioned in chapter 9, we, look, we studied it already. You remember when the bottomless pit is open and the smoke comes up and the locust comes up and they have tails like scorpions and they torment men five months and they had a king that led them and he was the king of the bottomless pit and his name was Abaddon or Apollyon. You know all that? Okay, it's destroyer is what that means. Now, there is a beast out of the bottomless pit. Okay, the Bible says he's, he's the king over those demonic I think the demons. There's also another, <clears throat> some people say, well, that that king that led that locust army, 200 million man army, or that, that locust army, I'm sorry. Some people say, well, that's the devil. And I don't know. I don't know if that's talking about Satan himself or not. What we're going to get into, not next week, but the following, chapter 13, is we're going to see the beast. Okay, and the beast is the Antichrist. Okay, we're going to see the beast who rises up out of the sea, the Bible says, and he is the beast that we know of as the mark of the beast and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so we, 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 we don't know if this is referring to, who, who, we don't know who kills. Is it the beast leading the, the locust army that kills them, or is it the Antichrist that kills them? I tend to lean toward the Antichrist. And chapter 9's beast that led the locust army may be the same beast. We don't know for sure. Okay, but there's a, there's a, they are killed by the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit. There's a power, a demonic, um, evil power, whether that's the devil or, or, or the Antichrist, whatever it is, okay, that kills them and they, they, they are killed. Now watch this. And their dead bodies, shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So where's that talking about? Where, where was our Lord crucified? What city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay? But the Bible says spiritually that city is called Sodom and Egypt, but it's, it's, it's Jerusalem. Now watch this. So they're killed and their dead bodies are laying in the street of the great city. And they of the people, okay, laying in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Okay? So for three and a half days, their bodies lay in the street and nobody moves them. Okay? They don't bury them. They don't do anything. Here's these two witnesses. If it is Moses and Elijah or Moses and Enoch or Moses and John or some two other people that we don't know, they're killed and their bodies stay there. And the Bible says that they, now I've heard a lot of, I've heard a lot of prophecy teachers say this right here, and you may have heard it too. When these witnesses die, everybody in the world is going to be able to turn on their TV and see the dead bodies of the prophets laying in the street. And that may be the case. But I've heard about a lot. Okay, when, when we get a real bad wind, <clears throat> my satellite goes out. Are you with me? 
All right. Um, I'm not really confident in the Wi-Fi signal at this point in the tribulation. Okay, I just want to say to you, I'm not sure that, can you hear me now, is going to, I mean, it's, I don't know that that's going to be, I, I don't know that CNN's going to be like live streaming or, uh, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I don't know. <clears throat> of course, all the CNN guys are still going to be here, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> And the MSNBC guys are the beast, okay? <laughs> Bunch of lying jack wagons. <laughs> now, so their dead body, I don't know, but w- notice what it says. It says, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations. It doesn't say every person on the planet. It says they of them. I believe in Jerusalem. I, I don't know. I'm not saying that there's not going to be some sort of, sort of technology. First of all, uh, large chunks of the earth are uninhabitable at this point, and, and, and we're ever increasingly pulling in close to Jerusalem, so I think the world's a lot smaller anyway at this point. But nevertheless, they're seen. Their dead bodies are seen three and a half days and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now, i got to hurry here. Got four minutes. Listen quick, okay? And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. Now, it does say that people everywhere all over earth are going to rejoice that they're dead and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. They are so happy these guys are dead. They're sending flowers to each other and they're, hey man, let me buy you a coffee. Hey, let me, let's celebrate, okay? Because these guys are dead. Now watch this though, and I want you to understand this. Dead bodies lay in the street of Jerusalem and here's what happens. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, (laughs) and great fear fell upon them which saw them, I would imagine. They come back to life. And watch this. And they, the two witnesses, heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Come up hither is used, by the way, in after the seven letters to seven churches. The first verse says, after this, I heard a sound or a voice as of a trumpet saying to me, come up hither. And we told you as we taught through Revelation 4 that that is the rapture moment for the church. Come up hither. There is sta- there, there appears to be a standard verbiage, come up hither, that God uses when he calls his people home. And he calls these two preachers home, and they were dead, and they're raised to life. Now, let me make just a couple closing points. Oh, no, hold on. Verse 13, and the same hour, so at the same time this happens, and the same hour there was a great earthquake. In the city of Jerusalem, there's a great earthquake when these guys are brought back to life, okay? And the tenth part of the city fell. So one-tenth of Jerusalem will be destroyed. Now, we haven't read about any destruction in Jerusalem up to this point, okay? Everything's been in this part of the earth and this, okay? I mean, okay, it's coming home. This is where it's going to end up in Jerusalem. In the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. So there's there's an earthquake, a tenth part of Jerusalem falls, 7,000 men are killed, the Bible says, and the remnant were affrighted, okay? I would imagine, all right? And gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, that's big. They gave glory to the God of heaven. Because remember earlier, there's like all these plagues coming and people are like rebellious. Hey, I still ain't repenting. You know what I mean? Okay, they're, they're saying, they're giving glory to the God of heaven. Now, watch this. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Remember all the way back in Revelation 8 when it said that there's, there's gonna be seven trumpets sounding, and there's three woes, and that's the second one. So if you're keeping track of those woes, woe means terror. The angel said, terror, terror, terror. Now, why is all this important? We're going to stop there for the night. Let me say this to you, okay? Um, we're going to get into, um, next week, we're going to get a Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 is going to walk us through. You remember kind of the vantage points? What we saw tonight is the first three and a half years, and there's a temple, and there's all, all this kind of stuff, and there's two witnesses preaching. Then they're killed, okay? What we're going to see next week is kind of encapsulating all of history from the vantage point of God, and he's going to walk us through. And next week, we're going to, we're going to learn about 
What's going to happen? Where's Satan at during all this? Where's he at? Okay. He is somewhere during all this. And he's going to be cast down to earth during this time. There's going to be a war in the heavenly places while all this is going on on the earth. Satan is going to be limited to the earth. And then he's going to wreak havoc on the earth too because he realizes he only has a little while longer. It's game time. It's game on. It's almost done. And he's going to be fighting for his life. And we're going to see that play out. By the way, Satan is a copycat. Okay? Something interesting we're going to talk about, probably not next week, but the following week, is the beast. We're going to look at the beast, the Antichrist. And we're going to look at this beast. Okay? And the Bible says that the beast, the Antichrist, has a deadly head wound. And if people argue and, and debate over is the Antichrist assassinated D- during the middle? And, and I'm going to lay out some opinion on this. I believe there's a high likelihood, and I'll, I'll explain why, but I'll just tell you. I believe that I, what I believe is that the Antichrist, there's going to be a human leader who is the Antichrist, I believe. And he's going to assume power, but at that midpoint of tribulation, something's going to happen. I believe there's going to be an assassination or an assassination attempt on his life. And I believe that he is going to survive that assassination attempt or even die. And God is going to allow him to be brought back to life, but not powered by himself, powered by the dragon. And the devil is going to be, and I'm going to show you the language, how it reads, and we're going to break this down and understand this. But wouldn't that be, okay, the Holy Spirit seals those who are saved during the tribulation, okay, with Mark in their forehead and their hand, what does the Antichrist do? He copies that. He has his own mark in, in the forehead and the hand, right? Okay. He, God raises his two witnesses. He raises his. See what I'm saying? He's a copycat. There's the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. There's the dragon. There's the Antichrist and the false prophet. It's an unholy trinity. He's a copycat. He has no authentic, original thoughts. Okay? He just mimics God in a distorted way because he wants to be God. See what I'm saying? We're going to get into all this. It, 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 I, I like this stuff. Uh, I don't know. Y- y'all good? You learning anything? Um, it's good. I love it. It's, it's exciting. Um, it's challenging. It's supernatural. Uh, it's not Mayberry. I mean, it's, it, this is, Yeah. It's not Kansas. Uh, we're not in Kansas anymore, right? I mean, it, this is, it, it's out there. It's, it's not going to be great uh, for those who are here. But this, we need to understand, there's a special blessing that comes studying this book. Special blessing. Read Revelation 1. It tells us that. So thank you all for coming out tonight. And uh, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for this time that we can learn about you and about <clears throat> what you wrote to and gave to John, John to give to us. Lord, it is a special book. The most quoted by the church fathers down through the years is the book of Revelation. They preached it all the time. They were looking forward to you coming back. They knew prophecy. They knew it. And it is a privilege to teach it and preach it. We thank you for your word. Please help us to leave here with a burning desire to lead people to Christ because that's what matters. We can have all the knowledge in the world, but if it doesn't stir us to lead people to Christ and to live more devoted to you in our own personal life and point people to Christ, then what's the, what's the point of having knowledge? Knowledge puffeth up. We don't want to be puffed up. We want to be uh, educated. We want to go out of here with a fire. And I pray you do that. In Jesus' name, amen.